Um, hello, so for those of you who have joined us, we're going to be starting in about three minutes. We'll just give some people a chance to join the webinar and uh, we'll be kicking off one in uh, two minutes from now. Okay, thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm just going to stop this screen share. Um, so, um, just some introductions. So, I'm Daniel Flood. I'm the technical lead here at UTS Animal Watch Academy. Uh, with me as our main guest is Alex Waite, who is our creative lead and has also had a great career as an animation director. Uh, hey, guys. With uh, two decades spanning writer, director, animation, script consultant. Um, We've also got uh, Naomi joining, who is our Academy uh, Pipeline support person as well. Uh, Naomi hello. is a graduate from last year's cohort as well, so hello to both of them. Uh, we've also got Sarah Giddy, who is our studio coordinator, who is going to be managing our questions as they come through in text. Um, so today, Alex and I will be sharing, sorry, Alex will be sharing his insights and, and top tips in working in um, animation and visual effects. And it's a chance for you folks to put questions to him. Um, just check out this slide. This is a sort of uh, leg, uh, obligatory legal slide around the recording of this, um, this webinar. Go and have a look at that. Oops, sorry, there we go. That's okay. <laughs> yep. Um, yep. Yep. Shall we move on? Yeah, I think that's probably fine. All right. Off again. Um, okay, so here, here's us. You can probably see our faces already, hopefully, but here's some for uh, once we prepared earlier. This is myself, Alex, and Naomi. Um, so, just a couple of housekeeping uh, matters and agenda for the talk. Um, so, uh, just on the agenda slide. There we go. Uh, that's it. Um, okay, so we're just going to do a very quick overview of our course. Uh, Alex is going to offer his insights, and you can ask him any questions. Uh, we're going to also field some questions on technical careers as well, uh, which you can throw to Naomi or myself. Um, and we'll also let you know where to find out more information. Um, just as a matter of housekeeping, um, please ask all your questions in the Zoom Q&A section. I can see there's a few already, which is fantastic. Uh, just note the session is being recorded so you can get some of this video afterwards. Um, and the slides you see now you can get afterwards as well. Um, so just a brief kind of pitch of our course. Um, so UTS Animal Logic Academy is a collaboration between Animal Logic uh, and University of Technology in Sydney. Um, so it's a unique industry focused initiative. Uh, so there's a big focus on uh, learning by doing. Um, the course revolves around a project structure where you're sort of embedded with uh, industry professionals and you work sort of alongside them under their mentorship and learn uh, you know, skills that will, you know, so you do quite well in terms of uh, finding work in the industry. Um, the course is responding to a talent gap um, in terms of developing the skills that uh, employers feel is, is necessary for people to get work in the industry. Um, and also we're kind of um, mapping out some future areas of visualization as well. So you can hopefully be prepared for the, the future as well as the present. Um, so it's a one year accelerated master's course. Um, so a master's course is usually uh, longer than one year, so it's sort of a condensed course 
Um, so yeah, it's essentially one and a half years condensed into one. Um, so it's a real world collaboration between um, visual effects, the tech studio facility. Um, yes, we've, we've got a fairly good level of international exposure. Um, our graduates from our first three years of running have had quite high success in terms of the job market. Um, and we've been recipient of a few awards over the years. Um, okay, so I'm very quickly gonna do a poll in Zoom. Um, if anyone, okay, so I'm just putting up the poll now. Um, so we'll just take about 60 seconds for you guys to have a chance to answer the poll and that can just help us get a sense of um, what sort of backgrounds we're, we're talking to and what sort of areas you're interested in. All right. Okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the poll pretty soon. A few more seconds left if you haven't voted already. I see a flurry of activity on the poll. Okay, everyone's finished. Great. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. Um, okay, so um, now if you can see the next slide, maybe. Yep. Okay. Cool. So we're just gonna introduce um, Alex. Um, okay, so um, as previously mentioned, Alex has got a um, history as an animation director, a successful uh, career for several decades as a director, animator, uh, script consultant, and writer. Uh, he joined us at the start of this year as our creative lead for our Masters of Animation and Visualization course. Um, so I thought I'd just kick off a question to you, Alex, and then we'll go to okay. questions from the Zoom chat. Um, so just the first question, when did you know you wanted to get into this industry? Okay, good one. Um, thanks, Dan. And hi, hey, everyone. Thanks so much for, for coming to join us. Um, you know, happy to be here to, to chat to everyone. Um, yeah, look, it's, that's, it's actually, that's a funny question. I usually get asked about industry stuff. But um, for me personally, I always thought I wanted to get into uh, 2D animation because I love comics, uh, I love drawing and, and, and sort of cartoons. And I went down that path for quite a while. So after school, I went to, um, uh, to art school and sort of majored in painting and drawing. And then I did an internship at Disney. There was a Disney studio here in Surrey Hills that was doing all of the sequel movies, you know, um, Bambi 2 and, and Fern Gully 2 and all that kind of stuff. And so I went through there, realized very quickly how hard that was. Uh, uh, but then another thing happened, I, I, this movie that was out, and I'm showing my age now as well, but a movie called The Last Starfighter. And it was one of the very first uh, uh, 3D renditions of a spaceship uh, mm -hmm. was in that film. And, and I, just, I just loved it. It was absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. and, and another thing after that then, um, uh, Toy Story, the first Toy Story came out while I was drawing. And it was kind of like a combination of those things that I, that I just loved because it combined, you know, combined art, it combined movement and character, but also sort of, you know, the, the technical aspect. And, and um, so after kind of six months of that internship, and I realized, you know, I wasn't quite as good as drawing as I thought I was. Uh, I left, I went back to uni and did a, um, I did a multimedia degree just so I could do a bit of um, computer animation and kind of went into it from there and, um, you know, haven't really looked back. Hmm. Cool. Um, I thought I'd just fire up one more question as well and then we'll get to uh, questions from the, from the Zoom. Um, okay. Just as a, a general kind of question, uh, if you were to give yourself, if you were to go back in time and give yourself as a young man just starting out the top tip in terms of things that you know now that you wish you knew back when you were starting out, what would you, if you had to distill it to one, one bit of advice, what would it be? <laughs> just, just one. <laughs> I, probably, I probably have about 20, uh, to, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so many. Look, I mean, the industry has changed. Uh, the industry has changed quite a bit um, uh, since then. I, I kind of started in the, in the sort of, you know, uh, mid nineties. Um, and, and, you know, back then, in Australia, there was really only sort of commercial, uh, commercial work, and and uh, after a bit, I got some work at a um at a computer game company, um, but really the sort of character driven, acting driven sort of animation work didn't really kick off properly in Australia until sort of Happy Feet and Animal Logic. I mean, there was a bit of character work before then, um, but Happy Feet was really the big one. Um, so, looking back at it. You know, if I could tell myself that, um, you know, what to do, I think, I think a, a really important thing 
that I didn't realize till later was um, being a good animator isn't just about being good at animation. And, and there were so many things there that um, um, moments that I tried to just, I was focusing on, you know, a perfect, a perfect arc on a hand or some perfect little, little moment. But what really kind of what I realized later on was, um, you know, the director, uh, the animation director and the audience is really more concerned about clarity and, and is the intent of your shot coming across. And, and the unfortunate thing is that not, not everyone cares if the animation's perfect, um, but if it reads well, then that's what's most imperfect. So most, most important, sorry. So I spent a lot of time focusing on those, um, on those, you know, tiny little specifics and details and, and not really stepping back and looking at the big picture. And, and I kind of didn't realize that till later in my life. And once I realized that, uh, uh, then it made my work go faster. I was getting better shots and I was kind of getting stuff approved, approved um, uh, more often as well. Um, you know, there's, oh, there's so many, there's so many other things as well um, that I'd say to, um, but planning was a good one. I, I didn't, I, I used to rush into shots without planning them. Um, I think it's planning is, is just such a, for any kind of work in the digital industry, actually, um, making sure that you're approaching your work with, with a set, with a set plan before you, you know, put down a key before you actually touch the controls really. Um, well, I've had some animation directors in the past that would make us do thumbnails or make us, uh, you know, we would, uh, could record ourselves in an acting room uh, to show that as, start, as part of our planning. But, um, you know, when I was later on, I became an animation director. I, was, I saw as well that the animators who didn't plan were taking two to three times as long to get their shots through as the ones who spent a good solid day at the beginning to, to you know, sort everything out and get themselves um, get themselves ready on you know on how to approach it. So, um, yeah, absolutely, that'd be you know another one. Um, let me see what what else. Um, I think I think the last one um, that that you know I'd like to I would have I would have told myself as well is. Um, being a creative in a commercial world can be difficult for, for, and again, this isn't just for animators. This is for everyone who's, who's it from, you know, lighter to, you know, to a modeler, to, you know, animator, to re everyone who's, who has some sort of creative input. At the end of the day, we're working in a commercial world and you always have to compromise your creative vision for the betterment of the, you know, of the scene, the shot, the movie, the director, the producer, and so on. And, and so, I always like to tell people to have, uh, you know, have their own project on the side, something that they can own for themselves to, to keep their creative spirit happy. Um, because, uh, you know, you're always going to be, you know, accommodating someone else's creative, creative spirit to a, to a degree, because you can always come forward with your own work. But at the end of the day, you have to, you're, you know, beholden to the, to the story and to the director. Um, so it's good to have your own work on the side that you can keep working on you know, to, to keep that little creative part of you, you know, still happy while you're working in a creative world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Um, we might jump to some questions now. Um, sure. So I think there's plenty of you asking already. So if you haven't already, please jump on and ask a question. Um, I can't guarantee we'll get to everyone, but we'll do the best we can. Um, the first one is, what is the difference between this course and the Bachelor of Design in Animation or similar at UTS? Um, that's a sort of a, a UTS specific one, I suppose. Um, well, I'll just say one thing then, Dan, do you want to kick off for the rest? Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, look, from, from my, I've, like, like Dan said, I've only started this year. And, and from what I've seen and, and for what I've been experiencing this year, the biggest point of difference is that this course, um, uh, replicates a studio environment. Um, you know, there's there's really sort of no other course like it that does so, that does this. So, we will set up uh, the team or the class into into um, into departments. So there'll be an animation department, a modeling department, R and D, rigging, effects, and so on. And then a big part of this course is teaching uh, each one of those departments how to work on a pipeline, how to deliver uh, uh, assets between them how to take feedback, how to give feedback, how to work to, you know, how to communicate. And so really what we have is a scaled down animation studio, right? And so uh, graduates coming out of this course um, are aware of those kind of proceedings and that workflow and can kind of roll straight into another animation studio uh, with a lot of those boxes ticked off. Whereas um, I've seen in the past juniors who have come straight from kind of, um, straight from uni or from other degrees, uh, find it quite difficult to transition 
into a into a studio environment. Uh, Dan, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think that's, I agree with all that. That sounds like a pretty good answer. Um, yeah, and just, I guess the pace is a big difference as well. So, you know, um, because our courses are condensed masters, you don't get, uh, it's a very, um, you're here kind of Monday to Friday, so quite busy. Mm. Um, you're doing more and less time, I suppose. It's a, a more focused experience, I guess. Um, I might you, jump in as yeah, well a little. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, having done a bachelor's degree recently. Um, uh, I'd say that uh, I feel like a bachelor's degree tends to be more individual compared to what we have at um, at the Animal Logic Academy. Um, I think I think the collaborative bit about um, about the studio is probably the best thing compared to other degrees out there. Absolutely. And I mean, look at once you get to an animation studio, uh, you very quickly realise that it is about teamwork. You're working together with your team you know, on a, on a larger project, you can't just kind of, you know, be off on your own. And, and, and I think that, you know, the ALA really prepares people for that. It's, you know, yeah, really good point. Mm. Um, okay. So this is a good question. Um, Lucy is asking, um, how should I start off my career being a generalist in a small studio to gain work experience before applying as a specialist in a major studio? So I cool. guess it's that, that conundrum of, you know, generalist specialist early on. Yeah, look, that's like it's that's a great question, and um, I get asked that a lot because um, uh, you know when you're starting out, there are so many components of the industry that are just so much fun. You know, um, especially if you're on your own, you tend to you know model your own character, rig your own character, animate your own character, create an environment, do some effects, do some lighting. You know, you you, you kind of become a jack of all trades, and and it's quite um, and it's fun. It's fun to do, and and you can kind of be led into the into thinking that maybe. Uh, that's something you might want to do in another studio to do a bit of everything. And, and look, that is, it is good to have those skills um, because you do want to be able to communicate with other departments and have an understanding of what happens up and down the pipeline uh, from where you are. Uh, but I always tell people that you do want to have a specialty within that, within that field, right? Um, it's, it's because you can get a job um, at, a, at a commercial studio or an advertising studio as a generalist um, but then if you really want to progress in the industry uh, up to a higher level, level, if you want to be a lead, if you want to be a supervisor, if you, if you want to go through, you know, the visual effects or the film industry, you, you have to sort of specialise because a generalist only takes you so far. Um, so my tip then is to, it, look, it's good to have, it's good to, to have those skills. Um, but even as a generalist, um, we, when I've worked at smaller studios, we have looked for, a rigging generalist or a modeling generalist or a lighting generalist, you know, so someone who has a, has a primary focus, but can also dabble in a few other areas of the, of the pipeline as well to help out if needed, but generally they will have, have a, uh, an area of specialty. So that would be my advice you, to pick an area that you, that you, you know, you love that you're passionate about and try to develop those skills um, um, a bit more over your sort of the next couple of years of applying for work. And when you do apply for work, and if you do happen to get a job in a smaller studio, really try and put your hand up um, for as much as you can in that area or in that department. Um, even at a, you know, there's there's quite a lot of small um, advertising studios in Surrey Hills that will often kind of pick on people like that, will we'll get people in like that. And then there's opportunities there to take on more work that you're interested in. And I would, I would jump on them always. Um, so I've got a question that um, I might just answer quickly as well. Uh, so one of the questions is with countries putting holds on air travel and visas, would it be pointless for international folks to be applying for the upcoming semester and should we wait? Um, so the answer to that one is the next intake is January 2021. Um, so international students should apply. At this stage, we're anticipating that the international travel situation will hopefully be uh, you know, possible by then, essentially. Um, it's obviously challenging times, but a lot will change for the better. So, you know, yeah, next intake is in January, essentially. Cool. Um, and just on that, um, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's funny to note that um, currently at the moment we're teaching our students remotely um, uh, using kind of technology like this, like Zoom and Shotgun and everything. Uh, but this is actually becoming the industry standard around the world now. Animal Logic, Flying Bark. Uh, I know some, uh, some of the studios over at LA and in, uh, in Vancouver are doing this as well, where the artists are working remotely. 
and it's it's really interesting it's changing how we think about about remote work and about about um uh you know basically having an internet that exists outside the studio and so i think this is going to become more common as after this and and as we move forward so it's it potentially and hopefully will open the doors for a lot more international work for for all of you hoping to you know work overseas as well um, okay, next question. Um, so this is a bit of a speculative one. Um, do you think that using game engines such as Unreal to make uh, animation or CG movies is a future trend? Yeah. <laughs> look, absolutely. Um, um, look, I'll just have a quick answer on that, but then, Dan, you know more about that than I do. But but really, look, 100%. I mean, you look at games like The Last of Us, um, uh, the latest God of War, uh, the ability now to, to create realistic... Uh, animation, facial animation, performance, lighting in game engines now is is just incredible. You know, um, we're no longer cutting away to sort of like a, a pre-rendered cutscene in games anymore. It's, it's all done in engine. Um, and it's still able to convey that kind of same emotional intent. Uh, I know there are uh, there are now studios out there who are doing previs uh, using game engines as well. Uh, that's helping people with in on big sort of like Marvel type BFX films. Mm. Um, so absolutely, it's it's a you know it's a very viable kind of path forward. I, I also think um, what's this year called Plastic Wax um, are looking at doing stuff like that too. Um, yeah. So yeah, definitely. Mm. Cool. Um, okay, so Samantha Shepherd has a question. What is the recruitment process for getting a job in three D modeling? Um, so I guess I mean. It, it's the same process for any 3D job, essentially. So I'll translate that as uh, what's, the, what's the recruiting process for, for getting a 3D job in a general sense? Um, look, yeah, so so very simply, you know, your work speaks for itself. Um, it's always good to show, you know, if, if you are going for a job as a modeler, um, it's always good to be as clear as possible. Um, uh, when we're reviewing work, we like to see, you know, uh, we like to see the 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 model kind of very clear mm. it's always good to do a, a 3d turntable uh, we always want to see the mesh to see how clean the geometry is so i would do a you know i would do a a grayscale uh 360 then i would do a 360 with the mesh turned on and then i would do a 360 if if you're into surfacing and and, and everything and you want to you can you have that and you can render it out and go for it as well uh to show intent but really what it comes down down to is you know, just showing your models mm. and showing the mesh, how clean the mesh is. Mm. Um, yeah. And you can get away with, you know, I don't, I don't show, you know, and this goes for everyone, don't show kind of the whole breadth of your work. Don't show the work that you did two years ago. If you only have two, two models that, that are of a good standard, only show those two models. Mm. You know, don't, because you really diminish your, your, yourself and your portfolio if you throw in the, the, you know, the work you did at high school and just because it has an emotional attachment, but it's going to sell yourself short. Yeah. Um, I'm, else. I might jump, yeah, I might jump in with a, with an add on of my own to that. So, I mean, yeah, I think as well, something that people just starting out often sort of get wrong is like Alex just said, thinking you need like a huge uh, uh, quantity of stuff to show. Um, I think generally getting a starting job, you can, if you can do, if you've got a small folio with high quality stuff in it, that will open more doors than lots of stuff that's a bit scattershot. Absolutely. Um, another kind of thing as well is I think there's a bit of a thing these days where people often like to, you know, post frequently, share work in progress, etc. Um, my kind of advice is to don't do that. Like hold back on, you know, you only get one chance to make a first impression. Mm. So I personally suggest holding back and just showing your impressive finished stuff. Yeah. Um, that's my, my advice for that. Look, I would, I would just add to that saying it's good to have a group of friends or some industry people in the background that you can be sending stuff to constantly in order to get that kind of feedback. But absolutely what Dan said, then hold off and only show your best work to the, to the general public. Mm. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay, so next question. Uh, when's the best time to apply? Um, I think any time, really. Um, there's, you can apply now. Um, you can apply later on. Um, if you're... You know, not sure about applying, you can get in touch and you know, potentially, if you're, you know, if you're on the fence, you can show us your folio and we can give you feedback if you want. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, anytime, apply now. I think that's a really good point, actually, Dan. Um, uh, having people kind of, 
if you're unsure, showing us your work now and we can give you some feedback in order what to, of what to work on uh, throughout the rest of the year. Because we're, what are we in now? We're in almost May. That gives you another kind of six, seven months to work on something. Yeah. Um, so a question from Donna is, how is the social isolation working within UTSALA? Are there any pros and cons? Um, I guess I should just give a bit of context that in, like, like the entire visual effects animation industry around the world, our courses are temporarily switched to working from home um, in response to the COVID-19 mitigation. Um, so our you know, staff and students are working from home with a various uh, suite of solutions that are pretty much mirroring what's happening in industry. Um, but yeah, um, Alex, what's your take on the, you know, the how changes the dynamic, uh, pros and cons, etc.? Yeah, look, it's 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 been it's been fascinating, really. Um, the the good the good thing is a lot of the tools that we already have um, uh, adapt at you know adapt sorry at, at at working remotely. So uh, our number one review tool that we use is Shotgun. Um, which works in a pipeline kind of process. So artists can upload their work and then we can play through it. We can draw on it and write notes and it goes through, everyone gets sent their notes afterwards. So it works quite well. Um, and then outside of that, we're using Zoom for, you know, for dailies and rounds and doing, you know, in the morning with everyone, which is okay. Look, it's like, like we're doing here. I can, I can see everyone. Um, but there are certain things that, that just aren't quite the same in terms of delivering that feedback or being right there in person. Um, so for animation, um, um, you know, animation is quite a physical thing. Um, I, you know, I like to, when I'm directing animators, I like to sort of jump around the room and show exactly what I'm talking about. That's hard to do in Zoom. Um, also for technical things, sometimes it's, it's really much easier just to be next to someone on their computer rather than trying to do it remotely because you just want to reach through the screen and you, <laughs> and, and you can't. Um, but... Uh, you know, look, I do have to say that that this year's students, I mean, we've got, what, 44 students this year? Is that right, Dan? Uh, I think so. That sounds right. Yeah. They have done amazingly. Like, I, like we, were, we were really worried uh, when this first happened that we we're going to have to make some drastic changes to the project that we're doing. And, and they are just delivering. Like, it is, it, it, there were a couple of bumpy weeks at the beginning. Um, but it's working smoothly. You know, we've got, you know, Dan has been getting the pipeline working remotely with Naomi's help as well. Um, you know, the tools are working. We've got, like, it's the edits working as well. It's actually, it's, you know, everyone has adapted quite quickly. Um, as frustrating as it is not to be there in person, um, yeah, yeah, they're, they're doing a great job. Um, I think this one's a pretty good question. Um, do you need to have a 3D animation background to apply for this course? If not, how would you go about preparing a portfolio as someone who has a background in 2D art and design? Um, you want to, I mean, look, I don't think you do at all, but Dan, do you, you've done this for longer than I have. Yeah, right? sure. So, I mean, yeah, so we've always had a certain percentage of students that have a, a 2D art background. Um, so, yeah, there's no, you don't have to have a 3D animation background. Um, so if you have a 2D art and design background, um, just, you know, present us your portfolio as best you can. Um, sort of be mindful about which aspects of it are going to be most relevant for, you know, 3D animation visualization. Um, uh, yeah, so we would probably, in that situation, if you applied, we might throw you a, a some kind of a, a, a test potentially in like 3D modeling or something just to see how you go. Um, but yeah, the door is certainly very strongly encouraged people to apply. If you're not sure about your 3D credentials, that's okay. Just get in touch and we can talk essentially. Yeah, I mean, look, we, this year we have a few people who, who come from, like one person especially comes from a very traditionalist art background mm -hmm. and, and the pathway in the digital world for those artists is usually uh, concept art mm -hmm. um, and then what's called environment artist and um, which now involves, you know, using new, using projection maps, creating uh, the background design elements and, and, and map painting elements as well. Mm -hmm. And then also surfacing. Um, you know, if you can, if you can, because of the tools nowadays are very, are very painterly, you're, you're kind of, you know, you're, you're painting on the 3D object rather than just kind of, you know, on a flat plane. So if you can paint on a flat plane, plane, there's no reason why you can't paint on a 3D object as well. So there definitely is a, um, a, a pathway for that more traditional artist in the, in a digital world. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so just skimming for a good question. Um, okay, the question for Alex specifically, what is your personal project that you do on the side to stay sane? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. <laughs> um, look, I have a couple. The, the, last, the, last, 
the last few years, um, I have been, I've been writing um, a lot more uh, than doing kind of 3D on the side. Um, because I ended up, uh, when I was finishing up on uh, Blinky Bill, um, I got contacted by a Chinese studio who wanted us to uh, help them out with, a, um, with doing previews for a, for, a, um, for a show they had. And the script was terrible. Um, so I kind of had a go with them and helping them fix the script. And they loved it so much that they asked me if I could um, write another screen for the, the sequel for them. And that ended up turning into kind of like three more written projects that led to some more written projects and so on. And so nowadays I tend to write uh, uh, more as my side projects than I do for anything else. That being said, I have been working like on a sort of combination graphic novel could be storyboards for an animated project, uh, you know, which I think is a, lives in a kind of, I guess, a adventure time type sort of, you know, post-apocalyptic world, a little bit cartoony, a little bit sort of, Post-apocalyptic is my is my side project. Yeah. Cool. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Next question. Um, so um, uh, one question is: Does it help if you do this course straight after doing your bachelor's majoring in animation and visual effects? So, I guess if someone's come from um, a three D course already, um, what's the benefit to doing this course essentially? Oh, well, look, I will. I would say. Unless you're unless you're leaping straight into the industry after your course, why would you delay it? And 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 you know the the I mean Dan, you know the numbers, but the re, re, you know recruitment rate of graduates from this course is astronomical. It's so huge. So I mean I don't really see the benefit in delaying. Um, you know this. I mean if you if you kind of went off and you got a job in the industry and came back, I guess we could help enhance your, your, your skills and your ability if you're struggling in certain areas. But I would recommend, uh, you know, it would be, you'd want to kind of jump to this as soon as possible. I don't know, Dan, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think so too. I mean, like you said, we've, uh, graduates have had quite uh, high levels of success. Um, it's a you know, relatively difficult industry to crack. And I think what our course, I think what our course offers is probably more unique than other courses is a sort of, um, uh, well, you, you know, your, your teachers are from the industry, essentially. So you're sort of, you know, you're right off the bat, you're starting with some kind of a professional network. So there's a much bigger focus on, um, uh, like a lot of courses focus just on skills in like in an isolated sense, you work on your skill in a standalone kind of way. Uh, we do that too, but we also put a big focus on um, the broader context of how do you, you know, how do you interact with people? Um, how do you, you know, network professionally? Um, how are you presenting yourself online and, and um, how to hit the ground running when you actually start as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so another question, which I think is a pretty interesting one is, okay, how have you dealt with confidence and or imposter syndrome when it comes to your work? Are there any techniques you have? Oh, wow. Um, I can talk about that one too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, that, that happens, that happens to, to, to everyone. That happens to all of us. I mean, uh, Look, uh, the the animation industry is is a very look. It, it, it's frustrating, but honestly, it's fun. It's a fun, fun industry to be in. I mean, at the end of the day, we're we're you know at the best of it. We're we're making cartoons and and I'm animating fun creatures for 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 a kids movie. You know, for and it doesn't necessarily have to have to be kids, but for an animated film, like it's it is it is and and relatively compared to sort of other skilled professions. Uh, it, it pays quite well as well. So absolutely, they're, they're, you know, you can think at a certain point that you're getting paid all this money to do something that's relatively silly at some times and, and it does make you feel like um, a bit of an imposter. Also, um, the, uh, the people that uh, I work with every year are becoming more and more talented and, and, um, and you know, also it, it's hard to keep up with, the, with all the new technology that's around. But you know, at the end of the day, I remember it's not just about the, um, like I said before, it's not just about how good you are at, uh, at, at being that skill. It's not good how, uh, not just how good you are at being an animator or a rigger or a modeler. Um, it's about how you approach the work and how you are at, at what's called the soft skills. Uh, so that's becoming bigger and bigger nowadays is being adept at the soft skills. That's like, you know, how do you communicate? How do you, um, uh, how do you take feedback from others? How do you interpret feedback? And and that's kind of like the area that once you get past the ability of how to um 
of how to do the technicality of your job, um, you know, you end up really focusing on how to develop yourself in those soft skill areas. Mm. And, and for me, that's what combats that kind of um, that imposter syndrome, because while there's always someone who's going to be better than you at, at you know, modeling, rigging, animating, um, what you can bring to the table after years of experience or is, is, you know, how you work within that team and how you kind of communicate with others. And, and really the people that I've seen progress and, and being promoted in all the departments are the people who can do that. And, and there's always the people who um, are amazing at doing their specific job, but unless they have a ability of doing those soft skills, then they just end up being sort of like the gun lead, but they never really progress further into, you know, sorry, sorry, gun senior, not even lead. They don't become a lead. They don't become a kind of supervisor or so on. Um, and, and for me, that's, you know, that's what I kind of like try to focus on. And then I know that that kind of helps me get over that. <laughs> I know, Dan, you? Um, yeah, um, I think that sounds, that sounds right. Um, I've, um, yeah, I think uh, in terms of the imposter syndrome, I think it's something that most people experience at some point in their career. Um, mm -hmm. Like if you, you know, try to break into something for a while, when you finally do, it can be kind of surreal. Um, yeah, um, uh, I mean, I guess the main advice is to just be aware that it's pretty common. Like a lot of people can relate to it. So, um, you know, just, uh, yeah, talk to, talk to friends, talk to peers and, um, yeah, so you can, people can empathize, I'm sure. Um, okay. I'm just looking through more questions. Um, what kind of, okay. What kind of habits do you develop to do or learn things effectively watching tutorials? So I'm taking that as essentially uh, like while learning things like while watching tutorials or study, uh, what kind of habits are effective towards uh, learning and retaining that information? I don't know. Naomi, you want to take this one? Uh, okay. Yep. Sure. <laughs> uh, I guess my kind of my recommendation is to be working towards some sort of end goal, like set a project for yourself. Um, so you're not just kind of watching or following tutorials without context, but um, you, you're you um, learning stuff with with something in mind with mm. um, with that project in mind. And I, and I think that's more effective um, compared to watching tutorials seamlessly. I, I struggle with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think tutorials are good though when you absolutely don't know anything about the software um, that you're about to use. Like, Say, for example, in my case, it's Houdini. <laughs> um, I need to watch a couple of those. Mm. Just, uh, I might just add to that question as well, Naomi. So you, you came in with a computer science background, that's correct, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. And when you started, you, you didn't have any 3D experience as such, did you? I, I did have some. So oh, okay. I, I was familiar with Maya too. Okay, right. Okay. But um, like a lot of the stuff you ended up spending a lot of time on, it's like, um, texturing and shading and stuff. Like I imagine you had quite a lot of information to take on quickly and yeah. your, your information passed. I think one thing that kind of, one experience that kind of stands out for me was um, taking the proficiency test with surfacing back in the first week. Um, I was marked as a beginner in surfacing <laughs> mm. um, because I just didn't, I wasn't familiar with substance paint. Mm. Um, and at the end of it, uh, substance painter ended up being the the main tool that I work mm. in. Yeah. yeah, cool. I mean, cool. just to clarify for people who don't know, um, one of the things we do in one of the first weeks of the of the course is what's called the um, proficiency tests, where you get it, we we do two tests a day for five days, and you get given a uh, a task, and it covers every kind of department in the pipeline from from concept design and modeling to rigging to to R and D and effects and Houdini. And and you're sort of thrown into the deep end uh, with a list of list of tasks, and really just to see how far through mm -hmm. them you can get, and also the quality of what you can do. And so, it it provides a it's a couple of couple of things. It gets us to see you know how good everyone is at, at their specific um, um, area of expertise, but also it gives people a chance to try all these other areas in the pipeline that they might not have tried. And then kind of you know we've had people who wanted to be you know, in one area and now I just say, you know what, I love doing surfacing and they, they just want to be a surfacer now and, and, you know, it's open the door and help people kind of try and define their area of um, specialty a bit more. It's, mm -hmm. it's lots of fun. Yeah. 
Yeah, cool. Um, I've got another question for Naomi. I might just throw it to you now, Naomi. Um, yep. Do you want to share what you have enjoyed about your um, experience studying at the MAP as a, as a graduate who's now working here? Um, yeah, I, I think I really enjoyed just being able to step into a studio, a kind of big classroom with other people and to see what other people are doing. Um, and and that was that for me that was really useful because um instead of having to message people about you know oh i can't do this i need help with that you could just kind of tap someone on the shoulder and go hey i see that you're good at doing this thing can you teach me can you share the skill with me? um i think that was pretty cool um okay so next question um so this is a good question i think um what do employers look for the most to in junior graduate, junior slash graduate level employees? So what, what are employers looking for in um, juniors essentially? Cool, um, yeah, really good question. Um, so look, I, I'll, I'll kind of approach this from, a, from an animation point of view, and then maybe Dan, you can talk about another department, but in animation, uh, so let's see, on, on, I was the animation supervisor on um, uh, the Guardians of Gahul, the, the Owl movie. Um, directed by Zack Snyder. And um, we, at one point there, we had about 110 people in animation. And I think we must have interviewed around 600 people um, over the course of the sort of a year and a half getting people in. And, and we developed a kind of shorthand of, of um, you know, who would fit in and what we were looking for. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, skill has has a you know has has a lot to do it you know would would have a look at a reel and if it's you know had all ticked all the right boxes in terms of can understand physics uh, you know things went floating if something was jumping or landing or falling people they people the animator understood physics mm -hmm. and then the second one was um, acting choices um, and then you know were they doing something interesting with the acting choice that we hadn't the thought of you know were we surprised by it um, and obviously clarity for both of that as well was the clarity there. And that's really just the, that's kind of like the first, you know, get you in the door. Uh, the second one, and kind of almost the main part is, was really just about attitude. Um, and it's just the, the don't be a dick rule, uh, uh, really. And, and we kind of just established that as the, you know, as that's the main part, because it really, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you are the most amazing animator in the world or artist in the world. Uh, if you're impossible to get on with and you can't work well with others, you can't work on a team, you're simply not going to get work in the industry. Um, uh, the industry is very small. It's especially small in Australia. Um, recruiters talk, supervisors talk, directors talk. Um, and that really was our main thing. We got, for juniors, primarily for juniors, we know that, uh, that juniors are coming to us with a very small amount of things on their reel, right? So usually people are anxious that, you know, I've only got my school project on my reel and, and you know, what am I gonna do? And it's not gonna be good enough. Uh, look, we understand that, everyone understands that. So don't be worried about that at all. We were really looking for people who, you know, had a couple of things on their reel, but then it was about the attitude. Did they come in with enthusiasm? Uh, were they willing to learn? And did they seem like someone who could work well on a team? And because then after that, you know, people learn on the job. People are given the opportunity to, to test out rigs, to test out shots. Um, you know, and once you're working at home, you might just be able to download a rig off the internet and, and do with it what you can. But when you're, on a, when you're on a production, you get given, you know, generally a pretty nice rig and you get a chance to do some really fun acting. And that's where you get the chance to prove yourself. But so um, really before that, yeah, sorry, I'm, I know I'm going around in circles, uh, mm -hmm. but really, it really is about the attitude. We really want to work with people who are making our, who will make our life easier because we work long hours and, and the work's hard enough without, without people kind of making it harder as well. Cool. Yeah. Um, uh, another good question is, how do you deal with procrastination or creative blocking when, anima when animating? Oh yeah, good question. Um, so look, I, it's a great question actually. I have found, um, I found a rule about that that I think has worked for me. I've realized that anytime I'm, I pr procrastinate uh, uh, with a shot or I'm finding it difficult to, um, uh, uh, to progress with a shot, it's usually because I know I need to scrap it and start again and I can't bring myself to do it. 
right? That's that's for me. That's ninety percent of the time. Um, uh, you know, and that's also the difference between a junior animator and a senior animator. Um, and I've seen this a lot as well. Um, while a junior animator sometimes could animate better than a senior, um, it's about how you approach feedback. And uh, if the feedback is, you know what, I don't want the character going that direction, I want them to do this instead, a senior animator will go, okay, shrug their shoulders, delete the shot, start again, and re-deliver a different blocking like within a day. Uh, whereas a junior animator will be reticent to get rid of the work they've already done, and they'll start kind of make little movements towards that direction rather than just starting again and it will take weeks to nudge it in that final direction and and anytime i've procrastinated or kind of you know been slow on something it's always because at the back of my mind i've known yeah you know what you just have to scrap it and start again um and i reckon you should you know it's a good rule to 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 follow cool um, so there's a few questions from brenda surrounding modeling so one of them is um, to apply for a 3D model position, are you expected to be really good in sculpting? And another part to that question was, if you're applying for a modeling position, do you have to include surfacing in the modeling? Um, I think you touched on that one before, Alex, but do you want to just recap your advice for the model? Yeah, for look, um, I don't necessarily think you have to be good by sculpting. I, I assume you mean sort of like the ZBrush, ZBrush kind of, kind of path. Uh, no, you don't, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, ZBrush is good at, at, um, at you know, coming up with a sculpt of the model, but after that, it has to live in a piece of software and the verts have to be clean, the geo has to be clean. Um, and so, no, you, you don't have to. I mean, more often than not on a production, we will use with sculptors who live in the art department rather than in modeling, right? And so they, they, they're basically creating a 3D sketch uh, that gets used as a piece of concept art, uh, but doesn't really exist in the pipeline. That concept art is then given to the modeler to remodel and, and kind of make it, you know, make it uh, pipeline, you know, pipeline worthy, basically clean it up. And, and so you don't have to have that, that sculpting ability. Um, look, it's a nice way to quickly bash something together if you want to test something out, um, but no, you don't have to. Um, look, the same thing goes with surfacing. There is a, uh, a natural progression of modeling to surfacing. And uh, at the uh, MAV here, we do encourage the modelers uh, to create their own UVs. And so they have an understanding of how uh, modeling and UVs work and how they can work together so they can help the surfacing department. Um, and because there is that, that natural part, that progression. Uh, but to get a job, no, you don't, it, you can, you can get a job on a grayscale model and just showing the, um, just showing the geometry that it's clean. You don't necessarily have to have a surface at all. Um, just going to follow up one more question from Brenda as well. Um, yep. So uh, following, following those ones, Brenda's got a question. Um, what would you give yourself as a title for as a fresh graduate? So if you've primarily specialised in modelling, would you call yourself a modelling generalist or a 3D generalist or a 3D modeler? Um, I think there's no kind of absolute answer to that question, but um, what, what's your take on a, a good... Look, I would, I would, if you want to be a modeler, I would call yourself a modeler. You know, there's there's no there's no moment where look there's no moment where you become a modeler. If you're at home now and you're modeling, you're making models in 3D. You're a modeler. You know, same thing if you're if you're you know doing some shots at home or animating something. You're an animator. It doesn't you don't have to be given a title or a crown or some sort of award in order to call yourself that. Um, uh, I would do that also for the clarity of recruiters, uh, because if a recruiter uh, goes on LinkedIn, say, and looks up modelers, and you're suddenly, you're, you've put yourself down as a generalist slash modeler, you might not come up in their search. Um, so I would just do that in terms of yourself for clarity as much as possible. Definitely call yourself a modeler. And look, you can adjust your portfolio and your cover letter depending on what job you're going for. So if you are going for a generalist, you can change it to generalist slash modeler, uh, and you can tailor each application accordingly. But but um, yeah, for your profile, I would try to make it as clear and succinct as possible. Um, just one little talking point that I might throw out as well. Um, we haven't got any questions on this just yet, but I might just put it out there. Um, so our course also, um, we always have in our intake uh, students with a technical background as well. So um, our course caters to and you know relies upon students with um, strong technical backgrounds, so computer science, you know, engineering, software development, that sort of thing. 
Um, so um, if anyone has any questions on that front, um, that's that's Naomi's background here and it's my background as well. Um, so if people want to know any more about that, uh, just feed us some questions and we'll get to them. Mm. Um, okay, the question is, is it possible to get a job as a storyboard artist and a compositor on the same project? So I guess can, on one given project, can you span multiple um, roles? Yes. Okay. You know, good question. Um, yeah, look, there's, there's, there's no reason at all why you can't, why you can't do that. And it does happen. It does happen. Um, usually on a big, in a big studio, you know, people are hired for the one job. And unless you are, you know, a specialist in both roles, can you get a job in another department? Look, it doesn't, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen for sure. Um, now, storyboarding, yes, happens in pre-production. Compositing happens later on uh, in, you know, in post. So, uh, logistically, in terms of the timeline, there's, there's no reason why you couldn't do that. Um, but on the last two projects I've worked on, um, storyboard has run while, <laughs> while compositing was still, was still going. So, there's, there, you know, there is still an overlap with that. I look, and it does depend on the project. But generally, look, in a perfect world, in a perfect world, storyboarding is done before animation starts, uh, you know, and then there's, you could roll off into another department after that. So yeah, for sure. But you would need to be, you know, once you get to it, once you get to a big, a big kind of feature film industry, um, you can't, but you, you're not really a generalist anymore. You do need to specialise. Um, okay, another question is, what is the best way to showcase your work to a potential employer? Um, albums of artwork on ArtStation or a strong showreel? Um, I don't know, Naomi, Dan, do you guys want to field this one? What do you think? Um, I'll, I'll just answer really quickly, then I'll throw it to yep. you, Naomi. Um, my answer is both, essentially. Like, I, I think uh, it's generally expected to have a showreel. Like, you, you sort of have to have one. A lot of job applications will just let you into a showreel. Mm -hmm. um, but I think having impressive work on ArtStation is good as well. Um, I think the thing with ArtStation, just to be a bit mindful of, is ArtStation often ends up serving as like a diary of your progress as a human being. For some people, if you signed up when you were like 16, you might want to consider, if it's for job applications, you might want to contemplate either filtering out some of your earliest efforts or make a, a professional, you know, a professional industry facing one that doesn't have all of your initial experiments. That'd be my advice. Um, yeah, the rookies is good for that as well. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any, um, Naomi, do you have any thoughts on that? Any advice? Um, as someone who kind of scrambled towards putting together a portfolio at the end of last year, I was biased towards getting the showreel to be looking good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think it's interesting though, because for, for some people with that, with a tech background, sometimes you just don't have that showreel. So, mm -hmm. so I guess it also depends on what skills you have yeah uh but for animation look yeah you need a you know there's no there's no kind of question about it you need a show reel mm. yep um okay luke has a question saying i'm studying a game design course that i'm finishing off next week i'm doing an elective modeling class at the moment where we're focusing on game assets should i keep focusing on game assets heading into applying for this course or should i move more to film quality assets to move more towards what? Sorry, Dan. Did you say? Oh, uh, like film quality. So uh, film um, quality. Yeah. yeah. Look, I mean, I tell you what. What I love about what I love about about um, about game assets for modelling is that it forces you to be clean, right? And and you have a restriction in terms of the number of polys that you can use. Um, I think it's personally. I think it's easier uh, for. Uh, game uh, modelers to move into film than it is for film modelers to move into into gaming um, because you're used to working uh, you know neatly and cleanly and and it's helped you develop a really strong set of those skills um, whereas in in film you can you know you can get away with anything you know you can have you know a million polys on the face and you know who cares because you know the the farm has a million kind of blades to render everything out and 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 you know it always does help to have cleaner topology uh, in in film, and so the more that you have that understanding, the more that you're able to do that, you'll find yourself kind of getting better get better uh, models to model on a production if you can if you can show you can do that. Um, I would say then the only thing to be aware of um, then is 
you know, how to move forward into if you, if you, you know, if the door is unlocked and you are able to kind of now use 10,000 polys or something, what do you do? So, so keeping in mind now um, how edge loops work on a face for expressions, uh, how they work in the, in the high, um, uh, the high stress areas. So like shoulders, uh, shoulders and hips uh, around eyes and the corners of the mouth, uh, those kind of things. So just, you know, uh, looking at the FAX system, that's a FACS system for facial expressions if you want to be a character modeler. Um, and then if you want to be a environment, an environment modeler, um, you know, it's again, making sure that you know how to kind of replicate something natural. So using, if you are going to model uh, something from the environment, make sure you're matching a photograph. Don't just, you know, go from your, go from your head. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, okay. So one of the questions, there's a few questions around internships. Um, so uh, someone's asking, are there any, any internships available for bachelor students in Sydney studios? Um, I assume that is an, I assume that question is about our course, I'm guessing. So we're not a bachelor course, it's a master's. Um, but as to the question, do we do internships? Um, we don't actually do internships as part of our course just because there simply isn't time. Um, the course itself is kind of like a giant internship effectively. Um, I, would, I would argue that every, every week you're here is, is sort of com comparable to an internship. Um, and um, if we had to add that component, it would really change the structure of the course quite a bit. Um, yeah. So yeah, we don't have internships, but I also believe that our course fundamentally is an internship in a sense, or com comparable yeah. to. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and look, yes, the, the two main studios, Animal Logic and Flying Bark, uh, do uh, have opened, uh, I think, once a year, once every two years for interns. Um, they pop up every now and then, so keep an eye, an eye on their site um, where you can apply through their site, but that's really the only way to do it um, mm -hmm. is just by, by looking at what, when they post for them uh, to come up and be available. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, so um, we were scheduled to finish at four. Um, there's a lot of people still here, so we can keep going through a few more questions. Oh. Um, if anyone does have to run, I'll just give a sort of the wrap up pitch a little bit, I suppose. Um, so um, it's worth going to our website if you haven't already and checked out some of our student projects. Um, so just Google UTSALA and click on projects. Um, you, yeah, so that's if you want to enter it directly, it's animalogicacademy.uts.edu.au. Um, if you have any further questions, you can email us at animalogicacademy at uts.edu.au. We might, I might type that into the chat so you have that in text. Um, okay, let's go through a few more questions. Um, okay, so what would I have to know if I wanted to focus on the technical aspects of the course? Um, I might suggest that's for Naomi and myself. Yeah, Alex? yeah. Right. Uh, Naomi, do you want to, it's probably a good question for you as a student who's had a technical kind of focus recently. So the question is, what would you have to know if I wanted to focus on the technical aspects of the course? Um, I think you need to, you, you'd probably want to have some fairly strong foundations in programming. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you can use Python, that's, uh, that's one thing that we use a lot, largely inside the studio. Um, we also use C++. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll pass. Yeah, C -sharp I'll, pa Unity. I'll pass that back to you, Dan. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say C sharp as well for Unity is another one. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So another question is, what are the differences between creating content for streaming, i.e., Netflix versus cinema releases? Um, Alex, do you want to take that one? Yeah. Look, I mean. There used to be there used to be a um, a, a difference between uh, creating content for film, TV, and VFX, right? Um, whereas you know film, um, sorry, feature film, as in feature animated film, uh, and and usually for animation it was like for feature animated film, an animator would be would have to do would be given a quota of three to four seconds a week of animation to output. Uh, VFX was around six to eight seconds uh, per week. And uh, then TV was around the sort of anywhere from 10 to 12 for, you know, for the better TV shows upwards to sort of 25 and onwards for the kind of uh, the more cartoony style uh, children's ABC kids kind of TV. Um, Netflix though, nowadays, um, 
you know, it's doing really high end stuff. Uh, it, it, it falls more into the camp of of the kind of VFX slash feature film area than than what I would call TV anymore. I mean, the um, you know, the uh, Love Sex Robot special that they did uh, was outstanding. Um, I mean, that the the quality of some of those shorts, um, you know, challenges what I've seen in some animated feature films, you know, and some VFX films as well. It's amazing, and and they're doing that at you know, on the same pipeline, the same tools as, as, you know, every other VFX film and animated feature out there. So I would say there's no difference at all in, in that regards. Um, it really, you know, Netflix and those other streaming services now are, you know, really coming to the table with, with, you know, the money and the quality for the animation industry. It's pretty cool. Cool. Um, okay. Question from Kerry. Uh, what laptop technology tools or portal device do you recommend for students learning animation software that can also be used in the visual effects film industry standard? So I guess learning um, industry standard software like Maya and Houdini and stuff. Um, do you, I, might, I might offer a quick answer to that one. You got yeah, go for it, go for it, please. Yeah. Um, I mean, essentially just, I don't know, the best computer you can get your hands on. I mean, I think ultimately whatever computer you've got, you can kind of, like, I take a positive approach in that, if you have a, a new and fast computer, that's fantastic. You can kind of, you, you can run anything. Um, if you have an older, less powerful computer, it's not the end of the world. You can still kind of learn to model things individually. Um, I think um, I think computers today are powerful enough that anyone with some kind of computer can learn something at home. Yeah. Um, you might not be able to do huge, you know, pyro simulations in Houdini, but um, even with a relatively old computer, you can still learn the basics of 3D modeling, for example. A hundred percent. So my, my home computer is, I'd say, 10 years old now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it was a bit of a workhorse when I got it, but it, it hasn't struggled at all. In terms of modeling, animation, rigging, uh, uh, those kind of areas of the production, it holds up perfectly. Uh, it's only like, Dan, like you said, it's only when you get to the more kind of, um, you know, CPU intensive kind of Houdini running simulations, rendering kind of parts where that does it start to fall down. But, you know, it, how much of that do you need to do at home? I guess that depends on what you want to specialize in. Um, but for if, if you don't need to be doing that, then nowadays, you know, even the more cheaper kind of simple computers can, can manage pretty much most stuff. Mm. Cool. Um, so just one more question about, um, I think we've sort of covered this, but just we'll kind of recap. Um, expectations of employers for um, graduate positions. Um, so what are the expectations of employers when you apply for graduate positions? Um, so I think we've said before, um, do you want to offer like a, a really quick like quick uh, 30 second recap, Alex, to that one? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, when you say graduate positions, I'm assuming you mean sort of junior positions? Yes. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, so look, uh, uh, Grad, uh, all, all jobs, all companies will know that as a junior, you have a limited amount of, of stuff on your reel. So don't panic about what's on your reel. Uh, they, people will want to know, do you have a basic understanding of the skills that are being asked for you, of you for that role? Um, so if you're in animation, do you understand the basic principles of timing, physics and, and acting, right? And you can show that over one or two shots. We've hired people over one or two shots. And it's the same with modeling. Do you understand the basic principles of modeling in terms of, you know, shape, contrast, construction, and clean geometry? Beyond that, it really is about attitude. Do you come to the table with enthusiasm and a willingness to learn? Uh, because I would say that as a junior position, you're going to learn 90% of what you need to know on the job. And, and all you need to do is come to the table knowing that you know the basics and you're willing to, you're willing to learn. You're going to be easy to, you know, and, and easy to kind of get on with, work on a team. That'd be my kind of main, my main outline, what I'd be looking for. Cool. Um, okay, so we've just got two more questions. So one is, is it useful to know Unity to be a 3D modeler? Um, I might have a quick crack at that one. Um, yeah. I'd say not necessarily, it's not really essential. I mean, um, if you're wanting to get into, you know, game environment artist work, especially, um, it'd be pretty handy to do some, um, to become familiar with like you know building levels and stuff in Unity. Um, mm -hmm. Unity is used in film, but it's in a bit more of like a experimental role, like in sort of virtual production. Um, I'd say fundamentally no. Like if you really just want to focus on being a great modeler, you don't need to. Um, but if it's something you're interested in, you know, throw yourself at it. Like it's certainly 
follow, follow what interests you, sort of my advice on that one. What's your take, Alex? Uh, look, I, I, I agree. You know, it, it's, it, it's again, just the specialist route. You know, if you're, if you're going to be, if you're going to be a modeler, be a modeler, you know, throw yourself into that hundred percent. You know, it, it's, it's, I, I don't think you need to know um, those components unless you're specifically working on a computer game and they want you to be able to have an understanding of certain limitations. Um, but again, that's something you can, they can brief you on and you can find out on the job. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So there's one question, which is what was your experience when working overseas or in a different country? Um, not sure if that's, um, have you, have you worked? Yeah. With... <laughs> <laughs> I, should have, I should have planned that before I read that out. That's all um, right. Look, it was fun. It was fun. I worked, I've worked in the States, uh, uh, for around San Francisco for about a year. Um, I did a bit of work in New York. Um, uh, I worked in China for a while, which was, which was interesting. Um, actually, that was the most interesting, I, you know, because um, we forget, uh, okay, just an anecdote, I really am, because basically at the end of the day, there's no difference. A studio is a studio. Um, you know, if you go to any studio around the world, it's, you're going to have the same type of pipeline, the same type of structure. There'll be sort of, you know, de the same sort of departments and the same sort of roles and expectations. What I found, uh, the difference being uh, as, a, as a sort of writer director in, in China was the difference in terms of, um, of acting performance and cultural differences for comedy. <laughs> I just found we really struggled uh, when I was working with the writing team over there uh, uh, with the jokes because we just had a completely different sense of sensibility of, 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 you know, of comedy. That was my, you know, it was a lot of fun. I loved it. And the team over there were just fantastic and, and, you know, were great, but otherwise, look, otherwise, that's the benefit of this job of this role, isn't it? Of the industry is that we can travel, you know, it's, it's, you can go overseas, with a set of skills and, and kind of slot in to that kind of department, you know, all over the place. And, and the main hubs being, uh, you know, Canada, America, London, or sort of, you know, LA, Vancouver, London, uh, you know, provides great locations for you to kind of go and, and, and travel. And then from there, travel the rest of the world. I think it's, you know, it's, it's really cool. Mm. Cool. Yeah. Um, just to mention as well, like quite a few of our graduates have ended up working overseas as well. So we've had students graduate and go and work in, uh, I think, Vancouver, London, um, yeah. Toronto, I'm pretty sure. Toronto as um, well. Yep. So yeah. It's a, it is a very global industry. We've certainly seen our graduates mm. um, you know, take advantage of that. Um, okay. So that's, we have no more open questions. Um, I think it might be a good time to wrap up essentially. Um, if anyone has a, a question you just don't answer, now's the time to throw it out there, but currently there's no open questions. Um, I'll go put, put it back on the slideshow. Sure, that'd be great. Yeah. Oh, yes, thank you. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's all right, we can skip past that one. Yeah. Uh, we covered that one already. Um, yeah, so just to recap how to apply, um, go to our website, um, you can find all the information there. Um, you can follow us on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, check out our student work on our website. Check out our YouTube channel. We've got a fair bit of content there. Um, and yeah, follow us for updates. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very to, much. Thank, yeah, thank you. you. Thank you, Alex and Naomi, and the, the, the behind the scenes staff helping us out. Um, thanks, thank Dan. You thanks, Naomi. No problem. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we'll do this again soon, hopefully. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. See you okay. around. Thank you, everyone. See you guys.